This is exactly right. Like you weren't going to start it, so I just started it. Yeah, I was you, waiting for you. Were you doing a dramatic hold? Well, I was. I couldn't remember if we decided to say Medford or Boston. I think it's, Bo- it's Boston, right? Yeah. I mean, should we do another one too? Yeah. Let's do one for Medford too, just in case they're sad. What's up, Medford? What's up, Medford? <laughs> <laughs> Now, if you were really funny, it would have been just dead quiet when we said that. <laughs> just fucking not one response in the entire room. And thank you, ma'am, for your one woman standing ovation. Yeah. It was really brave. You didn't, you didn't look back till the very end. <laughs> and then you sat down right away, so we knew you weren't crazy. That's just nice. That's a good feeling. What's great about tonight is, unlike last night, and I, I could be wrong about this, there's not canned wine for sale in the lobby, so everyone isn't thinking they're drinking one glass of wine when really they're drinking two and a half glasses of wine out of a can. It was 11% alcohol in a can of wine, and from what I understand, a regular beer is 4% alcohol, so people were just like, I'm just going to have a couple sips. Fuck yeah, yeah! <laughs> She's talking about me after the show <laughs> when I had two and a half glasses of wine in a can. <laughs> Georgia had six cans of wine. <laughs> I you barely made it here <laughs> today. But luckily, I wasn't the naked man running around outside of our hotel when we got back. You know, it's been an amazing tour so far. Mm-hmm. We've seen the sights. We've seen everything the East Coast has to offer, mm-hmm. including a man who lost. He had, his shirt was off, and I watched him step out of his pants and then <laughs> turned and went, naked guy on the street, should we hold here at the, should we pretend we're going through our purses at the trunk and yeah. just hang out for a second? We but went for it. He was not conscious of us or anything Mm-mm. else. And then I flashed you later. Yeah, that's, that was fun. I like to... Um, no, no, tell the whole story. Oh. She fucking, you open with the punchline and then you think you're just going to keep going? Well, then uh, I, be, I got to my hotel room and I opened my bag of stuff and it was Karen's bag of stuff. And, and then I looked at my phone and Karen's like, oh shit, you have my bag of stuff. Let's <laughs> trade. And I was like, I'll come to you. She's like, I'm at the elevator. I'm like, this is my fucking chance. And I had on like, um, like a strapless dress you know, throw on little dress. And so uh, I hit her floor and I'm going up and I'm like, what if there are um, cameras in here? So I wait till the last minute and pull my dress down and then just step out of the elevator and hand the thing. Yes. You're right to cheer for her tits. You're right. (laughs) She's been gifted by God. Thank you. Here's the thing. Georgia's done this to me many times. She's a, she's a touch of a nudist. <laughs> it's and just a ev- great prank, I think. Every time, it is like the surprise. I can't process what I'm looking at for the first, like, half a second. So I'm like, well, it's her face. What are we doing down here? Like, every time, I'm like, duh. Hey! I gotcha. Hey! I gotcha. That's not a shirt with pictures of tits. That's your actual tits. <laughs> Titties. Gotcha. <laughs> also, it was um, a Friday night in New York City in a pretty busy hotel. So the odds that there would have been some rando dude standing next to me were, I would say, pretty good. I thought of that as I stepped out of the elevator. <laughs> Immediately felt shame and embarrassment. <laughs> Pulled it up pretty quick, but I, you know, I got the, I got the point across. Well, for my, for my experience, you stepped off the elevator, and it was like one of those dresses with an elastic top here, and just the elastic was down there. It was like I chose almost like an off the shoulder dress. She was like, "I'm doing off the tits tonight." Yeah, I don't think Vince even knows I did that. Secret. My, my own husband. 
secrets. We have secrets. Um, we're in a high school. I know. Do you guys know that? You're our student body. Ooh. This is just what it's, this is really what it's like, though. They should warn you in high school. It's like, you're kind of going to be in high school forever. Mm. Just get used to it. It's always going to be this feeling of like, we were, we were supposed to prepare something for the talent show, <laughs> but we got drunk and showed each other our tits in the elevator all night. And now we're like, hello, my baby. <laughs> Do we say Medford or do we say Boston? I don't, I don't know. know. Why, did we Why didn't we decide before? Why don't we practice? <laughs> well, at least we have our rug to yes, distract our everyone. Our handy rug. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We brought it from home. <laughs> yep. We didn't bring Steven. Sorry. Yeah. It was the rug or Steven. <laughs> <laughs> He's Steven's like, you can roll me in the rug. <laughs> This rug's not going to take care of my cats and send me lots and lots of photos of them when I'm sad about it. Is it? <laughs> no, it's not. Um, but yeah. Oh, this is uh, my favorite murder of the podcast. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. That's Karen Kilgara. And this is Georgia Hardstart. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. You guys were the ones that woke up early on the day the tickets went on sale, got the early show tickets. You're okay. fucking on it. You're Thank the responsible you. ones. That's right. Good job. You guys are the ones that are you're like, I want to go see him, but I'm not staying up all night. <laughs> no, I have shit to do. Yeah. We support that. I'm a pastor. I have to get up and do 7 a.m. mass tomorrow right. morning. I'm not just going to... Yeah. I can't just... I can't be like... All the time. Oh, let's talk about your outfit. <laughs> oh, all right. Tell us. Thanks, everybody. Oftentimes when we're on tour, I go through a thing called outfit resistance, where <laughs> I just don't feel like getting an outfit. Um, uh, but this time, I rolled the dice. I went on to uh, the internet, where they have lots of clothes, so and I was just like, just order a couple things and see what happens. So this old thing rolls in, and I tried it on. I was like, great, it fits, everything's perfect. And then... <laughs> Thank you so much. I like that a couple of people were saying it like, pockets? <laughs> pockets? It can't be. It couldn't be. They gave a pockets? <laughs> yeah. I love it. I didn't even know. I didn't know didn't when know. I ordered it. It's just a fun surprise. <laughs> bonus. I, it was kind of like a pocket bonus. <laughs> and then I stuck my hand in them the other night. Yeah, because they're nice deep pockets. They are. This woman goes, oh. And then there's cough <laughs> drops in there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of hers. like a, a reverse didn't... pinata. You have to come in here. <laughs> <laughs> then there's fun stuff. <laughs> like cough drops. <laughs> And what about your dress, I just Georgia? Have, I've worn, uh, this is a dress. I bought it. I got $10 shoes on. Thank you. Very nice. I put my really nice high heel gold shoes next to the door at home. And Vince, who was coming out after us, I was like, if you can put those in your suitcase, bring them. Don't forget. And he was like, okay, I'll try. And then got to the hotel. And he was like, I couldn't fit them. And I was so fucking happy about it. <laughs> You know, in the future, you don't even have to go through any of that. You can just not bring them. I know, but, you know, I wanted to try. And Why? So, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's the weird thing I have. Um, and so I got $10 shoes at Old Navy instead, and that's what's happening. And I am very happy with my yeah. decision. And they have shoe po foot pockets. <laughs> oh, my God. You can put your foot in There's there. a whole knife in there. <laughs> um... Oh, wait, do a spin. It's a, oh, yeah. a feature that you didn't know you had last night. Look at, look at Scarlett O'Hara. <laughs> you could put crinolines under there and go to a uh, dance. I'm dizzy. Uh, I could say you're busy or you're dizzy? Dizzy. <laughs> I'm too busy, I'm too busy to, to, go to go to that, that dance. dance. Nobody asked me. Stupid. <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> um, should we sit down? Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. These are nice. Oh, I want to... Never in the history of fucking this podcast live has the table been tinier. This is, this is less a table and more an elbow rest, actually. 
I mean, it's really all the room we need, but... But still, it makes me feel give us a little more than we need. I feel inferior. Uh, also, th- uh, we were getting driven here by a, um, someone who works here, and we were like, what shows have you have been here lately? And I still feel the energy. Uh, what was it? Price the Price is, is Right, right Live, Live was, was here. here. Did you go to it? I didn't even know that was a thing. Was it amazing? Was The Price Right? Did you win two cars? Was Plinko here? <laughs> that sounds fucking amazing. And then I just realized <laughs> just Plinko now. Was Plinko here? <laughs> Did Plinko come? Oh my god, did you get a photo with Plinko? But then I just realized I could actually go to The Price is Right actual show. Yeah, in our our hometown. In our hometown, but I was really excited about it being here, too. We asked if Drew Carey came. Turns out he didn't. So if you're bummed that you weren't here, don't worry. I bet you they got a local comic who tried their best. (laughs) I wonder if they gave actual money away. I bet, I, they bet they I bet they did. I bet they did. Actual money. <clears throat> That's and fucking cool. If you were at <laughs> The Price is Right Live, please write to myfavoritemurder <laughs> at gmail.com and let us know what it was like. Yeah. We'd love to know. <clears throat> oh, this is a true crime comedy podcast. That's right. There are rules and regulations. I mean, there's all kinds of stipulations. Mm-hmm. Um, we basically like to tell people, because sometimes people bring... Uh, sometimes people are fans and then they bring people who are not fans to the show and those people have no fucking clue what's going on. They're like, this isn't really what I want to be doing. And You just talk through the whole thing? There's just talking. It's just girls talking. Can you imagine? Ugh. It's the wave of the future. (laughs) Get used to it. It's going to start happening all the time. But, yeah, that's right. Here, we'll go first. (laughs) We're going to dominate the conversation tonight, but then go ahead and get out there and really do it yourselves later. (laughs) But we we just like to warn people, if you're not used to this show or whatever, we talk about true crime, which is really heavy and dark and can be very awful, and there's a lot of loss, and, 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 um, but we also... Uh, or make jokes to each other about it while we're talking about it because um, that's what we're like and that's how we talk to each other and and life is complex and um, sometimes difficult and if you don't like it, you can get the fuck out <laughs> is essentially our invitation to you, the person who doesn't exist in this room <laughs> and yet we're still dedicating five minutes at the top to them. <laughs> Is what we like to do every once in a while. We got heckled once in Australia, so now we feel like we need to give a warning at the top of the show. Yeah, we really it, just need to call that guy and yeah. be like, hey man, what the fuck? It's, we, should, we should do the warning is if you're a drunk Australian man that's not used to girls talking freely in the way they want to, <laughs> you can get the fuck If out. you just buy tickets to shit. <laughs> if you're a season pass holder to this theater <laughs> and thought, you know, what I, I want to go out at Saturday night. I have favorites of my own. I'd like to see what their favorites yeah. are. What's a po- It's like a radio show? A podcast is like, I love radio shows. My granddaughter likes podcasts. I'm going to give it a shot and get really shit-faced first. <laughs> then scream at them. <laughs> and then express feelings that have nothing to do with ha- what's happening in front of me, but that I can't talk to, to the real people I feel them about. Right. This is a psychology yeah, it's a, class. We're really judging that Australian guy, but... <laughs> I mean, I mean, come hey. on. With America's number one meal kit, HelloFresh, you'll get easy seasonal recipes and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door. All you have to do is cook and enjoy. HelloFresh makes cooking delicious meals at home a reality. From step-by-step recipes to pre-measured ingredients, you'll have everything you need to get a wow-worthy dinner on the table in about 30 minutes. Say goodbye to endless grocery store trips and takeout. HelloFresh has you covered. There's something for everyone, from family recipes to calorie smart and vegetarian, and fun menu series like Hall of Fame and and Kraft Burgers. HelloFresh has more five-star recipes than any other meal kit, so you'll know you're getting something incredible. HelloFresh is flexible, and it fits your lifestyle, easily change your delivery days, food preferences and skip a week whenever you need. Break out of your dinnerette and make deliciousness part of every week with HelloFresh. 
I love that even though HelloFresh is super easy and they make it really basic and like straightforward, you still feel like you're cooking this like incredible home cooked dinner. And that makes me feel good about myself. And that instead of just ordering takeout, I'm actually making something and preparing something at home. And that just, it feels good. So for $80 off your first month of HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com slash Murder80 and enter Murder80. It's like receiving eight meals for free only at HelloFresh.com slash Murder80, promo code Murder80. Go bye. Who goes first again? I think it's you. Okay. All right. I'm yep. first tonight, guys. Thank you. All right. You know what that means? You have the table. Can I please yeah. have some room? I'll just be over here, kind of freely in space. Table. Just thinking about my Spanx. Okay. <laughs> Let me talk to Spanx about a different, different panels in the front, more military grade <laughs> stuff. That some NASA shit, yeah, going on. One of those ones that gets this up here. Oh yeah, Why don't they have those. Yeah, this the slip I have on that's basically sausage casing was just like we're gonna pull everything in, and I'm like, not the tits, <laughs> I need that. They're like, no, the tits have to go too. Yeah, I, I have need to. all the help I can get. Sorry. I didn't mean to touch your paper. So I don't want you to see the name of it because I, then you would know that I'm about to do the Parkman murder. Ooh. Oh. Ooh. Great. Thank you. <laughs> um, Spooky Halloween. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is the murder of George Parkman. Okay. You guys probably all learned about this in your Boston history class. or In this very in building. This very building. When you went to high school down the hall. Well, then this will be <laughs> just a refresher course for you. <laughs> Hang in there. Um, I got a lot of info from the internet, but also uh, you guys have a local history podcast called Hub History, and they have a lot of good info on that too. So fucking shout out to them. Okay. So mid 1800s. Yes. There we are. Great start. Everyone, That's what we like. Everyone loves it. The smells, they're everywhere. <laughs> And then the bloomers and stuff. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> There's know. bloomers hanging from every everywhere. Gas post. Yeah. You just throw your waist into the street with the horses. Okay, so there's this dude named John Webster White. Okay, he's a doctor. He's from a well-connected family. He's a lecturer at Harvard Medical College. So like hoity-toity and shit. Mm-hmm. I know the type. Uh <laughs> chemistry instructor at the medical school. He had his own laboratory, excuse me, laboratory. (laughs) (laughs) I I went to Harvard. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't. You drove by. I did. The wing called Santa Monica City College. (laughs) You know. Uh, Okay, he's an instructor in the laboratory. Okay. He is described by Oliver Wendell Holmes as a pleasant, pleasant in the lecture room, but a rather nervous and excitable person. And this might be because most of his lectures and like, um, he shows people his, you know, um, laboratory chemistry stuff and it's like explosions and fireworks and shit. Oh. He just like mixes chemicals and then it's like kaboom. So he's nervous all the time. Yeah, I guess. (laughs) Maybe he shouldn't have gone into that line of work. (laughs) Right. If you're a nervous, excitable type, don't go into fireworks. Probably not your jam. <laughs> he had once been uh, wealthy. His, he had been from like a rich family in town, but they'd fallen on hard times. And he, maybe because he wasn't good at managing his money, he would do shit like buy a mastodon skeleton for a lot of money <laughs> and be like, Harvard is going to pay me back. And Harvard were like, we're not paying you back for that, bro. I fucking love this guy already. <laughs> <laughs> He's a handful. Um, He's all nervously buying a mastodon skeleton. <laughs> um, this is my interest. I'm also scared of it. <laughs> he, had, he had failed at running his own private medical practice, so he had become the chemistry professor. Um, and he kind of got free reign to do whatever the fuck he wanted. That included selling tickets to, to go watch his laboratory fireworks shows and shit which was like how, how he made extra money on the side to support his wife and four daughters. Okay. And they, I guess, were like used to like living it up in the high life because they had been rich and now they weren't anymore. So he was like short on money. I, I don't like that he's blaming his wife and kids because this motherfucker bought Mastodon skeletons. Yeah, I was going to so say. So I don't think it's... If you're short on money, go ahead and give up that Mastodon skeleton. Yeah. Even used, you could probably get <laughs> five, <laughs> ten bucks for it. Absolutely. Wouldn't you think? 
Um, so he had been, they've been forced to give up the mansion that, that they had built in Cambridge, um, but they were leasing a house that his uh, family was pissed that they weren't living in luxury, as I said. So uh, he was in debt to a lot of friends. He had borrowed money from friends. And, Nervously. <laughs> Um, okay, so then let's, this brings us to the next dude we're going to talk about. It's George Parkman. So he's born in 1790. He's the ninth of 11 children. Mm. It's a lot. And his father at one time was one of the wealthiest men in Boston. So this is another fucking hoity-toity, highfalutin family. <laughs> um, he's super smart. By the time he's 15, he's enrolled in, at Harvard to study medicine. 15? Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> That's when you're supposed to be smoking out by the railroad tracks. <laughs> Take it easy, friend. Uh, trying to look at girls' bloomers and shit, <laughs> right? Uh, he was into mental health, and he was concerned about the poor treatment of those in asylums. So he was always like, even though his colleagues were like, who fucking cares? We're rich. He was like, no, we should give a shit. Um, and so he also treated the poor... Uh, people in South Boston on his at, during his free time. Poor people. South Boston. Poor people. <laughs> We've seen your movies. We know who you are. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful accent. <laughs> um, so, and he contributed funding for a modern mental health hospital for everyone to be able to go to. So, not a bad guy, probably. <laughs> uh, he, was in he was in charge of his family's trust. They had maintained their wealth, so they were still rich as shit. And he was engaged in real estate investment and speculation. I don't know where that is. Uh, it's just where you pretend like you know stuff. Yeah, it's like, I'm going to buy that. I bet it'll be worth a lot of money someday. Yep, yep. Not mastodon skeletons. <laughs> Bury the mastodon skeleton in it, oh, and it'll be worth tons shit. of money. That's smart. Um, and that also meant that he was in charge of collecting rent for all the buildings around uh, Boston that he owned. So he would fuck. He was like kind of a, a cheapskate, so he like wouldn't even get a horse. I guess it's like someone not getting a car these days. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and so he would just walk, and he was so he's like a well-known figure in, uh, walking along the street. Because he walked Boston. with his hands up by his face like that. Yeah. As a matter of fact, <laughs> let me show you a photo okay. first of. Uh, John Webster White. Is it? Yeah. Oh, oh, God. I'm scared now. Don't be. Wait. Fireworks. Oh, no. It's not working. I think you pointed it that way, yeah. This way? Okay. If only. It's not working, and I don't want to show your... There we go. Oh, son of a... Okay, is that him? I'm scared to show your murder on accident. Don't worry about it. Okay. I know one's coming. <laughs> Okay, that there is John Webster White. That's okay, this is Nervous Fireworks Mastodon? Yes. Okay. It, you can see it in his eyes. You, yeah. can, you know, you've met this guy before. He looks like his hair has been blown forward from an explosion. <laughs> he is early Bieber adopter. Yes. But then also, he looks like a Los Angeles agent with the smallest possible glasses yeah. that you could buy at the store. All right, furrowed brow, and then... Son of a... Oh, no! I, okay. <laughs> I am the nervous one now. You didn't see that. Okay, so here's oh, George there he Parkman. Is. He doesn't do the walk again, because look at how he actually walks. No? What did I do? I don't remember. Ooh. Right. So he'd wear, he'd wear a top hat. He had a fucking insanely huge jaw. That was like one of his character, <laughs> character he traits. He was constantly arresting himself. Yeah. <laughs> He was lean and tall with a protruding chin, and he wore a top hat. Okay. So that was his thing. That checks out. And he has, yeah, I was, I was just going to say that, so shut the fuck up. <laughs> God damn it. Tiny feet, tiny feet. <laughs> so I'm so mad at you right now. And he had tiny feet. <laughs> <laughs> and in closing, he had tiny feet. Oh, that's what I was going to say. The tiniest. He was worth about half a million dollars in 1849, which is like 12 million today. <laughs> For real? Yeah. Wow. Probably. Oh. Um, <laughs> is that your guesstimation? That's what Hub History said, and oh. I stole it. Okay. okay. 
so he, um, well, he was kind of a penny pincher when it came to transportation. Um, he, <laughs> the guy with the chin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's the one walking around collecting rent, and he's rich as fuck, all these things. Uh, he was a penny pincher, but he was really generous with loans and with people who couldn't pay rent on time because they'd lose their job or had problems. So he'd be like, no problem. But then he would also, uh, was super strict about loans too. So he would be cool with it, but then he would be really hardcore with the date that they were going to pay him back and crazy interest as well. Yeah. That's how you get them. That's exactly how you get them and how you're gotten. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) So these two dudes are friends here. They had met uh, at Harvard as students. So they were friends and they knew each other. Their families knew each other, etc. Sometime in 1842, Webster Mastodon got a loan (laughs) of around $400 from Parkman. So in today's money, that's around $10,000. Jesus. That's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Um, So time goes on. Webster's not able to pay Parkman back. Parkman is a total dick about it. He's like following him around on his errands, being like, when are you going to pay me back? He'd go to his lectures. (laughs) But with his hands behind his back. (laughs) When are you going to pay me back? (laughs) Right. Give me that money! (laughs) Um, And he'd go to his uh, Webster's uh, explosion uh, lectures and sit in the back and just be like, you know, you owe me money and shit. He told everyone how much Webster owed him, which I'm sure is embarrassing when you were once a wealthy person and not anymore. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't know. Uh, (laughs) And then, okay, so he also raised his interest like crazy. And so now uh, Parkman... So he's still in debt to Parkman, and this is like seven years later, but uh, he still needs money. And so he, Webster goes to Parkman's son-in-law, this dude Shaw, and he's like, look, I will sell you my fine cabinet and collection of um, mineral collections. So it's actually like worth some money, but uh, I'll sell it to you because I need the money. And uh, I mean, isn't a mineral collection rocks? <laughs> don't know what that is. Okay, okay. Yeah? Mastodon? <laughs> you may have my rocks. <laughs> there, I've paid you back. <laughs> right. So he was like, I'll sell it to you. And Shaw was like, I don't really fucking need a mineral collection, but I feel bad for you, so sure, I'll buy it from you. Um, and, the, and the problem with this is that Parkman, way back when, when he gave him that $10,000 in today's money loan, mm-hmm. the collateral was said mineral cabinet full oh. of rocks. <laughs> so it was valuable. Yes. Okay. Um, and so if Webster was to default on his loan, he had promised him that cabinet, which he had just sold to someone else. So the loan at this point, seven years later, so it had gone from 10000 in today's money. Now it's 60000 mm-hmm. seven years later. That's kind of unfair. Right? No. How do you ever pay that back? Well, you don't, yeah, you don't borrow money you don't have, and then you don't have that problem. Yeah. Or at least not from that fucking guy. <laughs> yeah. Get a, get a guy with a better percentage. That's a great idea. Okay. I uh, solved it. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming tonight, everybody. <laughs> this is the True Crime Comedy and Banking Podcast. <laughs> it, we call it It's Just That Easy. <laughs> Um, and then Parkman fucking finds out about the mineral collection, uh, you know, trick. And he is fucking pissed. And apparently he had a little bit of a temper, too. Mm. So uh, what happens? Well, shortly after this, Parkman, our chin guy, disappears. Oh. Oh. Okay. So he's super known for his punctuality. Uh, you know, they always see him walk in the streets. He gets where he's supposed to go on time and everything. And so when he doesn't show up home um, on Friday, November 23rd, 1849, his family are immediately like, this is not right. Something's not right. Not wrong? No. <laughs> Something's not right. It's wrong. Right. That's right. Um, he was wealthy, so the police immediately give a shit. And... <laughs> <laughs> As did Another the, great tip. <laughs> right. Um, and the entire city cares, too, because the next day, the Parkman family placed ads all over in all the papers. They hand out 28,000 missing person flyers, and I'm sure with that drawing on it. Um, <laughs> and they also offer a $3,000 reward for his safe return. So I'm sure everyone in town was like, let's find this fucker. Yeah. Um, the publicity in his disappearance results in hundreds of tips and sightings. Everyone's like, he's right over there. <laughs> uh, 
and um, you know, everyone sees him. It's not him. Two days after the disappearance, our old friend Mastodon collector Webster, uh, he comes over to the Parkman's house because he knew them. He, they were family friends. Knocks on the door, and the wife of uh, Mrs. Parkman's like, "Oh, he's come to you know send his condolences or whatever." Instead, he's like, "Hey, uh, I saw him the afternoon he disappeared. We had an appointment, or like a week before." And, or maybe the day of. It's confusing. It's very it unclear. It was so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't save his calendars. <laughs> um. yeah. Nice one. Huh? I said nice one. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> So he was like, well, he came to visit me at my offices, those weird laboratories that I have in privacy at the uh, medical school. (laughs) And guess what? When he was there, I paid him all the money I owed him back, and then Mm -hmm. he left. Okay, well, great to see you. Yeah. Thanks for dropping by and just squaring up the whole story. Right, so he said, like, if maybe he had the money on him, was on his way to the bank and got um, robbed or whatever, but either way, the loan is paid. See you later. Yeah. I just cross my name off that list. Right. Yeah. And so Mrs. Parkin was like, hold up. You know, she's not stupid. She would call the cops and they were, probably didn't call the cops. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have that. They, I don't know. She pulled a weird string and then a series of bells went off down the street. Right. And it's like, a wealthy person needs us. Let's yes. go figure it out. Yeah. Um, and so police were told about the weird encounter and they kind of looked into it. They did some basic searching of Webster's office, but he was like, don't look in that cellar directly under my <laughs> laboratory or in the bathroom. And they were, they ha- would have had to cut through a stone wall to look in there. So they were like, okay, we won't. Goodbye. Great. Yeah. But instead they began dragging the Charles River and Boston Harbor looking for a body. They don't find anything. And then meanwhile, everyone in town is like, you know what we should do is let's find a poor person to blame for this, because that's more likely. Um, and so enter the janitor. Uh, his name is Ephraim Littlefield. He was what's called a swamp Yankee of rural origins. <laughs> that's problematic. I know. I don't like it. That's what Wikipedia told me. Very nerve-wracking. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so he basically wasn't from a wealthy Bostonian family of many loud, you know, they're, you know, he was not. <laughs> the table's so tiny. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, ta- the tiny table's spinning. It's really fucking me up. <laughs> um, so he had been the janitor at the Harvard Medical College since 1842. He and his wife, Carolyn, lived in the basement of the medical college, right next door to Professor Webster's laboratory. Mm-hmm. To supplement his income, he obtained cadavers for dissection, in which he sold to the professors, sure. which I think was on the level at the time. And as a janitor, he cleaned the doctor's rooms and laboratories and started their fires and set up specimens for their lectures. Real quick, started their fires. Yeah, like on the like legit le- on the level fires. Like we get in in the morning and it's freezing cold. Ah, yeah. Start your fires, <laughs> not arson. <laughs> the professor not comes arson. and knocks on their door quickly. Um, would you burn down my ex girlfriend's house? <laughs> I have to get to a lecture and I can't, my hands can't be sullied. It's part of my job. <laughs> no. Great question, though. Thank you so much. Thank you for clarifying that. Wood-burning stove. We're Wo- talking about stoves. the past. Exactly. Got you. Um, and, and help them in their labs with the specimens and such. So he kind of could tell immediately that people were suspicious of him. And so he was like, fuck this shit. <laughs> uh, and started putting some things together in his head and, and came up with a suspect. Uh, on his own. So he started doing, he, he noticed that since the day of Parkman's disappearance, Webster, his uh, wall neighbor, had been acting strangely, including that uh, Littlefield, the janitor, tell him what he saw the day of the disappearance and like uh, questioning hardcore on it. Oh. And he had like never talked to the janitor before. So the janitor was like, this is weird. And then uh, the day after the, um, when the cops had come to like kind of poke around, he 
gave Littlefield a turkey as a present. Mm -mm. And the janitor, Littlefield was like, this isn't right. This motherfucker would never give me anything out of the kindness of his heart. It wasn't November or any, like, seasonal? It was November, and it was Thanksgiving. Oh. However, he was a dick. No, you're right. No. It's like, (laughs) I get it. (laughs) I mean, if it was April and someone gives you a whole turkey, run away. (laughs) But no, you're, so Mm-mm. he's suspicious of the grati- of the uh, generosity. Yeah, Mm-mm. something's going on yeah. here. Um, and then uh, he had asked Webster, Webster had asked him a bunch of questions about the dissecting vault, and um, the, let's see, he had heard an argument between Parkman and Webster in the lab earlier that week, and uh, so he kind of knew something was up, and that Parkman had been there, and he finished. He cleaned the lab. But Webster's lab was uh, locked, blah, blah, blah. He heard someone moving inside when it was locked, and he thought that that was weird, so he peered under the door, which must have had a big... I mean, it must have been a big crack, because he, he saw a lot. He had to get so flat on the ground. Yeah. He, he saw him walk uh, between the furnace and the fuel closet back and forth, back and forth, and then when he touched the wall, the furnace was burning so hot that day that the whole wall was warm, and he was like, this is fucking weird. So... Um, he oh, takes and this turkey. <laughs> so he eats the turkey. No. <laughs> so uh, he also went into the room when Webster had gone. And then it says, just casually in like all the articles and shit, it says, he found that the kindling barrels were nearly em- empty, though they had be- recently been filled. And there were wet spots that tasted like acid in odd places. And nobody <laughs> questions that online. <laughs> That tasted like acid in odd places. There, that always happens when you're looking up a, like a certain event yeah. and there is a cut and paste that people don't check. So it's just like on every single website. Yeah, and it is. Like, and it's probably true, but it's like he, he fucking tasted, he like licked the acid that was on the floor. <laughs> now what's this? A animal urine or oil? <laughs> Look at this face. Or acid? I, just try it. <laughs> just get down and try it and then peek under the door. I just don't like that part. It it doesn't sit with me it's, well. I mean, the past, am I right? The past, everyone. So um, on November 29th, Thanksgiving, Littlefield borrows a hatchet, a drill, and a crowbar and a mortar chisel, grabs his wife, and is like, hang out with me while I do this. <laughs> I don't know, maybe they were friends. Um, yeah, it was a good marriage. <laughs> right? Yeah. So he starts chiseling away the wall under Webster's private lab privy, his Bad toilet. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, so he starts getting in there. He goes down a tunnel into a vault where the wall had felt too hot and begins to hack at it where the privy emptied into a pit that the police hadn't searched. Already disgusting. You know what I mean? But they don't really, it's just so mm, privy. Okay, so he goes through two layers of brick, eventually manages to punch a hole through the wall, peers in, it's totally dark, his eyes adjust to the light, and he sees something protruding from the ground. Turns out to be a human pelvis. Oh. Mm -mm. He also spots a dismembered thigh and the lower part of a leg, upper and lower leg. (laughs) Just like that whole entire leg. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Every part. part. All parts of a leg. Even the middle. That's right. <laughs> Some call it a knee. <laughs> not me. Mm-mm. So he's like, at this point, he's like, all right, I'm not going to, my wife's, you know, getting sick, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> he grabs another professor, and they go get the marshal. They all go back to the privy, and uh, they, they're all about to dig in. It's like a bunch of cops and shit, and they decide that the man with the longest arms would have to go into the privy <laughs> and hand out the remains, which I just pictured everyone just immediately going yeah. like, I, who is it? I, who would I don't it know who it's going to be. Should, do you want to do it, or should I do it? Let's measure arms. Well, I'll just put your arm in. Guess it's going to be you, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Long Arms, that's what they call him. <laughs> the long arm of the law. Uh... <laughs> Thanks. Wow, applause on that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that. I'm kind of with you. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to take it away, but... <laughs> I mean, it was pretty great, but <laughs> I, what do I know? I'm the one saying it. Okay. 
So, so he goes in, the, some poor Eric Longarm goes in and he hands out the pelvis, the right thigh, and the lower left leg. Then they go over to where the furnace is and in there is a jawbone and teeth. I know. And then they're like, do you guys smell that smell mm. coming from that closet over there? And they're like, yeah. So they go over It's to the, the privy, right? No. Oh. It's not the privy. They go in the open and they find a trunk. They open it and in the trunk is a torso and thigh. Ugh. Yeah. And um, so they go and arrest Webster and uh, they take him to jail on a charge of murder. He denies any knowledge. He says that the janitor must have done it and is um, blaming me for it. He uh, then takes something, a pill that he had been carrying with him. It turns out to be strychnine, but somehow it doesn't kill him. And I don't understand that because they're like, he was, in all the articles, it was like, he was too excited to die from the strychnine. I'm like, I don't think that's how strychnine works. <laughs> Maybe he was just too excited to die. <laughs> Maybe he, like, wanted to pop it in and, like, couldn't catch it or something. I don't know. It just didn't work right. on him. I'd Maybe he'd just been inhaling too many fireworks, yeah. like, fumes over right. the years. That's probably it. That's um, it. So he survives and goes to trial. The Webster, Webster Parkman case reaches national headlines, becomes one of those popular murder trials of the 19th century. Newspapers are fucking all over this shit, day-by-day accounts, and um, rich people are like, it wasn't, it wasn't our rich dude. It must have been the janitor trying to set him up. Um, and there were, was so much interest in the case that in the 12 day trial, they, uh, had to put bleachers in the courtroom oh. instead of seats. <laughs> yeah. Foam fingers and shit. <laughs> <laughs> Team Parkman. <laughs> Um, and then people, they also sold tickets to watch the trial for 10 minutes at a time, like in and out. In 12 days, they sold 40,000 tickets. What? <laughs> These fucking looky-loos. What if it was just one guy going 40,000 times? Um, Murderinos have been around forever. I know. That's what it is. Don't fucking tell us. I mean... The records show that uh, about 60,000 people attended the trial at, or at some point or, or another. Um, and so the trial is one of the first in American history where forensic evidence is presented. Oh. Because uh, they, they brought in uh, defense and prosecution, brought in medical experts to testify. And because uh, they didn't have the head, they were like, how can you be sure it's him? It might not be him. And it like, fucking totally was him. <laughs> uh, but so they had the jawbone, though. And so they brought in a dentist named Dr. Keith. Um, and so he had had to fit Parkman with a, uh, with like dentures recently. And cause his jaw was so fucking insane, he had to take these crazy molds of it. So he came in and like did a like dun, dun, dun in the, in the courtroom. Oh. It was like the mold fits in the jawbone that we do have, even though we don't have the rest of the head and stuff. So it was, yeah, it was totally him. So the, the picture where his jaws sticking out like that was the real deal yeah that was a real quality that he had that's right and then it, and then it came to into play at the end yeah did you do that on purpose make his jaw look like that no <laughs> <laughs> like oh talk about the jaw in the beginning and then later and that yeah <laughs> totally did that <laughs> on purpose well great job. i am a researcher <laughs> that's my job so uh, just, uh, Chief Justice Shaw, so this is the first time that this ever happens. He, usually the standard for um, saying someone is guilty was like 100% certainty. You had to be sure that they were guilty. This is the first time he was like, how about this? How about beyond a reasonable doubt, motherfuckers? Oh. And that was the first time that that happened. Wow. I bet he probably didn't say motherfuckers, but you know. It's um, in parentheses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, impl it's an implied motherfucker. Uh, all the evidence obviously points towards him being guilty. So Dr. after three hours of the jury deliberating, Dr. Webster is found guilty and sentenced to be executed. And a short while later, um, he shocks everyone by confessing. He, but he's like, not surprisingly, it was self-defense. You know, that old one. For sure. He claims that Parkman was in such a rage when he came to his office to try to get his debts that he uh, took the fire poker and hit him with it when he was coming at him. 
Probably not true. Um, he is executed by hanging on August 30th, 1850. And afterwards, Miss um, Parkman, the widow, she opens a trust for, the, for uh, Webster's widow and four daughters and puts large sums of money in it and just becomes a philanthropist after that. Oh, no. I know. Isn't that that makes me I almost started crying. Don't cry. <laughs> That's so nice. Isn't that lovely? That's so generous. I know. Why did she do that? I don't know. <laughs> it's like she's a good... I didn't woman. see it coming. I know. <laughs> We're all supposed to act like that. I'm going to cry. That's really nice. I know. I mean, she's a fuck... She was the widow first. Yeah. Everyone would have been like, you don't have to do shit. Yeah. You're good. It's basically like she started a Kickstarter for the fucking family of the man who <laughs> yeah, she did. killed her husband. Because it's not their fault that no. the husband is some fireworks asshole. Yeah. Oh, by the way, you can still see the mastodon skeleton at Harvard. <laughs> oh, my God. They were like, we're not going to keep it. Or we're not going to pay you back, but we'll keep it. Nice. Yeah. Um, so that is the story of the murder of Dr. George Parkman. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Widows helping widows. You know that someone wrote a musical about that one day, one, like at some point in life, right? Did or is going to? I bet did or is, yeah, either one. <laughs> did or is going to. Did or is to. going to. Um, there's one other picture, but I'm scared of putting it up. Well, let's see. I, and then really... if, if it's George's picture, we can have a final moment. And then if it's my picture, it'll be the beginning of mine. Great. Let's see what happens. What, what if it's nothing? What, what if, if it's no one? I think point that way. Really? Yeah. There we go. There's him. That guy. There's old Tiny Feet McGee. <laughs> <laughs> and then do one more. There's... Oh. No. No. Karen's. No. Nope. Yeah, that wait, that was kind of it. Oh well. I mean, something will happen. At you? In it? On it? Go around. Let's just I'll, I'll pass out my iPhone and you guys can all see the photo on that. I blame Steven. <laughs> oh, here we go. There it is. There it is. Okay. There we go. Look at that jawline. Oh. So that's the... Look how big his feet are in that picture. <laughs> Humongous. Not funny at all. <laughs> okay, let's see what mine is. Let's, what's yours now? Let's see. How could it be? If it works. What is it? Not that. No! It's the Great Molasses Flood of 1919! I feel like, let's just leave it on him. Um, <laughs> people who don't listen were not cheering for people getting hurt. Yeah, it's a good Remember one. the lecture Karen gave you before. <laughs> we're cheering because we want Karen to tell us the story. <laughs> story. Tell us our, tell us our, what are you doing? Still? Just the visuals. Okay. Oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. Tell us a story. Tell now, us a bedtime story. Here's the thing. I, uh was preparing to do, I was looking into a different one, and uh, as I did, it dawned on me that this truly is one of my favorite stories of all time, and I actually, it really is. I think the first time I saw it, it was probably on like Mysteries at the Fucking Museum mm -hmm. or some late night weird shit like that where I was like, wait, is this real? <laughs> it is the craziest, worst, story that's also oddly funny and bizarre. It's so Boston. It's so Boston. <laughs> Isn't it? It's just like, what happened to everybody with what <laughs> item? Okay. All of my information is cut it and pasted it from Wikipedia. Like, so crazy you wouldn't believe it. Please donate. We owe them so much. <laughs> So this is a 50-foot molasses, molasses storage tank. That's fucking huge. 50 feet. And it stands at 5... Or did stand, sorry, at 529 Commercial Street at the Purity Distilling Company facility in Boston's North End. Oh. 
That motherfucker contains. <laughs> tell me a secret. Tell me a secret. How Listen, much does it contain? I'm going to tell you so much about molasses. How many? It's crazy. How many shots did it take? <laughs> you guys, you guys. Do you want to do molasses with me? <laughs> two, over two million gallons of molasses Shit. was contained in this thing. Um, it was the property of the United States Industrial Alcohol, which was a company that took regular shipments of molasses from the Caribbean mm. and used them to produce alcohol for liquor. <laughs> yes. It seems so innocent, like molasses. Yeah. Oh, everybody's gonna have pancakes. No, it was for <laughs> liquor and it was for munitions manufacturing, oddly enough. Gross. Uh huh. <laughs> I only like one of those things. <laughs> Guess which one? Munitions. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so they built this tank in 1915. Um, because it was during World War I when uh, the demand for industrial alcohol had increased. Sure. But it was done in a rush, and so uh -oh. um, it was very haphazard construction. Um, so by 1919, four years later, um, this was a largely Irish and uh, Italian immigrant neighborhood. Uh, right? Let's hear it for all of us. Um, and... Uh, all these Irish and Italian families, which is, must have been the loudest combination, <laughs> if you think if you think about it, just people yelling and gesturing and telling endless stories, <laughs> eating and eating so much bread. Uh, by the way, we got a fucking huge box of cannolis backstage. Oh my god! They gave us from modern pastries. They call them lot. They call them lobster tails. And lobster tails. Lobster, I've ever seen a fucking lobster tail? I thought somebody had made two big croissants and then just gave them to us. <laughs> They're humongous. I already ate a half a cannoli before the show. I'm gonna eat another half for the next one just to get that sugar fucking yeah, high. that's right, you know that's right. Mean? And then bust out the back of your dress. That's right. <laughs> okay, so okay. the Irish and the Italians are completely used to hearing this tank uh -oh. um, rumble and make creaky noises. And they're like, <laughs> that old thing. Anyway, uh, as I was saying for six, 16 hours, um, it often actually leaked molasses onto the street and the neighbors would go over and just grab some and take it home and use it for themselves. Okay. It was very common. So um, nobody minded until January 15th, 1919. Okay. Um, and that day, oddly enough, the temperature had risen from two degrees to 40 degrees. Um, oh. even, even though it was January, it was a very mild winter for Boston. I was like, you must have gotten that wrong because <laughs> two, the two degrees isn't a thing. Yeah, it is out Did here. You I don't know. They do two degrees all the you time. Guys. No, for real. And they think 40 degrees is like kind of toasty. Oh my God. Yes. Do you know in California when it's 60, we're freezing our it's, fucking tits we're off? We're like, everyone stay inside. Yeah. And then you get your janitor to light a fire for you. <laughs> your ex-boyfriend's house. <laughs> Warm up by the ex-boyfriend's burning. That's no. right. Oh. Uh, don't. That's terrible. Who said that? Steven, edit that out. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Look at the rich people up in the balcony. <laughs> <laughs> oh! I didn't see without my monocle in. Oh. oh. The Wahlbergs are here. Mm. Welcome. Welcome. Look at our rug. Okay. So, January 15th, 1919. Okay. It's about 12.30 in the afternoon. Okay. And witnesses say that they felt the ground shake then they hear a roar um, and a rumble similar to the sound of the passing elevated train, which was right there, as you can see. Oh, I see it. Uh -huh. Right? Uh -huh. <gasps> um, so that some people thought it was like just a real loud train sound yeah, going yeah. by, but then there was a deep growling, a thunderclap, um, and a bang, and then Ooh. a crashing, and then 
a machine gun sound as the rivets of the tank came shooting out of the side. Like a fucking cartoon. Oh my God. Like when your girdle's too tight yeah. and then bing, 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 <laughs> bing. Except for it was a tank of two million gallons of molasses. Shit. So the tank collapses and it unleashes a 15 foot wave. Fuck. Of molasses that's moving down the street at 35 miles an hour. That's so fast. Run that fast to show everyone how that's fast That's so fast. It is. Um, is it hot? It's hot when it starts. Okay. So it's also fast when it starts. Fast so it's and hot. A, it's fast and hot. And so the way the temperature changed that day, like in the weather, affected the molasses itself. Okay. But then it... it it starts pouring out, but then it hits the air. So, so basically the wave starts and they use, they kept using the word viscosity in this <laughs> article and I just deleted it. I'm like, no. I don't know what that means. I don't, it sounds like a word. car thing for boys. I don't want to get involved <laughs> in viscosity. It's like a, mm-hmm. from an oil commercial that yeah. I saw in the eighties. <laughs> you like viscosity? You're going to love the new Ford <laughs> truck. <laughs> The 18, uh, 1988 Ford Viscosity. <laughs> it's Ram tough. It's Ram tough. <laughs> Car and Driver magazine. So, people, cars, trucks, Rams. even Rams, the, even the toughest of Rams, horses, are swept up in this flood. Shit. The Boston Post reported, which apparently was a paper at the time, molasses. <laughs> Waste deep covered the street and swirled and bubbled about the wreckage. Here and there struggled a form. Whether it was an animal or a human being, it was impossible to tell. Oh. Only an upheaval, a thrashing about in the sticky mass showed where any life was. Fuck. Horses died like so many flies on flypaper. The more they struggled, the deeper in the mess they were ensnared. A tray- Hum- Don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> never ending story. Remember that? Remember? Remember that? Remember how sad it was? <laughs> so sad right now. Go on. Sorry. Also, human beings died. Oh, right. That's, Sorry. That happens too. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> That's li- literally. Human- I know. I'm really- <laughs> Literally, the next sentence is, human beings, men and women, suffered likewise. Oh, Ugh. God. Should have just left that part off. <laughs> okay, so the wave is so strong, it damages this, this train that you see there. It knocks these girders out. I actually have a picture. Um, yeah. And it tips a railroad car off the tracks. Holy shit. Yes, let's see if we can do it. Let's I believe you can. Let's give it the old Harvard try. <laughs> local, local. What the? <laughs> oh, no. What? Did you see that? No, what happened? Is it porn? Oh, oh porn. It's porn time. Bring it all down. What kind of porn is this? <laughs> Listen, it's just what I'm into. Don't shame me. <laughs> I swear I'm only hitting the outside part. That guy. That guy. This thing. That thing. Okay, that broke. We were there. And then that. That's now we our go podcast. here. That's our podcast. That's, okay. Okay. Oh, look at you. Well, there's. How about this? We'll look at this. Just to prove. There's the Boston Post. There's a real newspaper. This came out afterward. You can see all the things. Yeah. I Sur- think, oh wow. There's. I have a picture somewhere in there of. No escape from the giant wave of fluid. It said. <laughs> yeah. Did you see that? Yeah. It was viscous. It really was quite viscous. Uh, but the, but as it went, so it came out as like water like. Mm-hmm. But then as it was out there, it hardened and of course thickened and got sticky. Eesh. So then it was harder and harder for people to get out of it. It wasn't just like, oh wow, that was crazy or whatever. <laughs> Engine thirty one, which was the firehouse in the neighborhood, is knocked clean off its foundation. Holy an shit. entire firehouse, causing the second story to collapse onto <gasps> the first. And the firemen that were there that day were all sitting down in the kitchen playing cards. Those lazy bastards. <laughs> I can say that because my father's a fireman. <laughs> and I know, I know what those people do. I spent my entire life going, Dad, can we please have cable? And he'd be like, no, we have that at the firehouse. You don't need it. 
That's, that was his answer to everything. You don't, you won't like it. It's not, you don't need it. I forgot your dad was a fireman. I was like, don't say that. I can. I can't say anything to a fireman. It's the greatest. Anytime my dad's complaining, I've said this on the podcast before, but anytime my dad complains or is an asshole of any kind, we're like, oh, America's hero is upset. Oh, America's hero. But here's the thing. So the rest, all the rescue people, um, the cops and the other firemen from around the city, um, they're there within minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, and they start this rescue. And so they actually get in. And even though the, uh, the second floor is collapsed onto the first, they manage to rescue and save all but one of the firemen. Mm-hmm. So that was actually kind of miraculous. Mm-hmm. Um, the nearby Clardy house which is, that's, my cousins are the Clardys, so I, this is my favorite part, even though it's horrible. Um, <laughs> the nearby Clardy house, meanwhile, is swept away what? and dashed against the L train platform. Martin Clardy, having just woken up, watched his home crumble around him before being thrown into the current. It has a current. Jesus. He said, I was in bed on the third floor of my house when I heard a deep rumble, and when I awoke, I was in several feet of molasses. Um, He nearly drowned in a gooey whirlpool before climbing atop his own bed frame, which he discovered floating nearby. So he had to like use his bed as a, as a like a makeshift boat. Fuck. Then he rescued his sister, Teresa. And my, my aunt Teresa was Teresa Clardy. Isn't that crazy? (laughs) What are the chances? Um, the Boston Globe reported that people, quote, were picked up by a rush of air and hurled many feet. So even if you didn't get stuck in the molasses, like the air that came out with it, people were being blown back from it. Dude, um, some fucking backdraft shit right there. <laughs> um, my dad hated the movie Backdraft, <laughs> except for the part where there's a Mercedes parked in front of a fire hydrant, and so they just bust out the windows and run the hose through mm-hmm. the windows. And my dad would not stop laughing at that part. He's like, we really do that. I've done that before. We really do that. <clears throat> but he didn't like any of the makeout parts. Oh, okay. Dad. Dad. A truck was picked up and hurled into Boston Harbor. Whoa. This was a serious tidal wave of molasses. Tea party for trucks, though. Oh, I get it. Mm -hmm. I thought you were being political, and I was like, ooh. Oh, not that one. In a 1983 article for Smithsonian, Edwards Park wrote one uh, one child's experience. This is fucking nuts. Eight-year-old Anthony D'Astasio is walking home with his uh, four sisters. Tony? (laughs) Tony D'Astasio! Oh, it's, that's a different neighborhood. Um, he's walking home with his sisters from the Michelangelo school. <laughs> <laughs> that's racist. <laughs> send the Italian kids to the Michelangelo school. Yeah. And send the Irish children to Whiskey High School. That's, <laughs> that's, it's what's going to happen. Okay, so this eight-year-old boy is picked up by a wave, by the wave. It was one big one. And he's carried, tumbling on its crest, almost as though he was surfing. His sister stood there and watched as he basically rode the molasses wave. Holy shit. For real. And then, of course, he was grounded. It, it rolled him it, uh, like a pebble, it says. And he could hear his mother calling his name, but he was covered in molasses and couldn't talk. And then when he opened his eyes, his three sisters were standing up above him like, dude, <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> um, let's see if we can do... There's, one, there's a really good aftermath picture. <laughs> there it is. I broke the That's whole thing it. at the end. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, that's not it. That's it. <laughs> that was a Futurama screen. Yeah. Is it? Can, can you pick it? Can you go down to? Oh, that's fine. Um, 
there's just one of the, a, a close up of all the devastation. It's it's just so crazy. So the aside from the cops and the firemen, there was also first to the scene 116 cadets from the USS Nantucket, which was a training ship from the Maritime Academy that just happened to be right there um, docked in the at the pier. Um, so they run several blocks in toward the accident and trying to, they immediately try to pull out survivors, but. Um, of course, as the molasses is cooling, everyone's getting stuck, which is like a fucking nightmare. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also reminds me of when I knew I needed to get stop taking theater classes. Was I was in a movement class, and they're like, and now act like you're stuck in honey. And I was just like, I'm fucking out of here. I hate shit like this. How does this help anything? We're never going to get stuck in honey. <laughs> oh, I was wrong. So the Boston police, the Red Cross, the Army, other Navy personnel, they all come to help. Some nurses from the Red Cross are diving into the blasses to try to pull people out. Right? While others tend to be, um, tend to the injured, keeping them warm and keeping the exhausted workers fed. Um, There's so many injured that they, the doctors set up a makeshift hospital in a nearby building and, um, uh, so because everything is taking forever and so long, they have to work all through the night. It took four days to rescue all the people who actually Holy lived shit. through that wave to get them out. Um, and some people were in the molasses and unrecognizable. Like it took a really long mm. time to identify the dead. Oy vey. It's horrible. So the cleanup crews, they had to use salt water from a fire boat to wash all the molasses away, and they also sprinkled sand out to absorb it. Um, and the entire harbor was brown with molasses until summer. So for six months, all the water in the harbor was brown. I bet it fucking stank, too. Yeah. I mean, I think maybe at the very beginning, you're like, breakfast! And then you're like, I can't. I'm going to throw up. Yeah. I can't do this anymore. Um, it took weeks to clean up that immediate area. Over 300 people had to help do it. And then in greater Boston, they said it took indefinitely longer. Um, rescue workers, cleanup crews, sightseers tracked molasses all over the city. Oh, yeah. so, so they spread it to subway platforms and the seats on trains, um, streetcars, telephone handsets, no. into homes. Um, they say, in the paper, they said everything a Bostonian touched was sticky for six months. Gross. And it's still that way today. <laughs> Just felt like that's what you wanted me to say. I don't know. I don't know. So two days before the disaster, um, warmer molasses had been added to the tank. <laughs> there it is, reducing the fucking viscosity. Mm. <laughs> That pesky viscosity. <laughs> that viscosity. Um, uh, so local residents brought a class action lawsuit. There were actually 119 lawsuits that were brought against the United States Industrial Alcohol Company, um, which it, they're the people that own Purity Distilling. And uh, that company tried to say that the tank had been blown up by Italian anarchists. Mm. But apparently that was a thing that happened during wartime is that anarchists would try to come to anywhere that they thought they were building munitions Mm -hmm. and blow things up, except for um, that was total bullshit. And Blame the fucking anarchists. That's right. It's always the Italians. Um, But a court-appointed auditor found that USIA was responsible after three years of hearings. It turned out that a man named Arthur Gell, who oversaw the construction neglected basic safety tests such as filling the tank with water to check for leaks. <laughs> just didn't do it. That sounds like step one. Yeah, no. He was like, ah, can we just not, could we just fill it with molasses and see what happens? <laughs> um, so the, when they did fill it with molasses and the tank leaked so badly that they just started painting it brown so that no <laughs> one could see how it was leaking Holy out on all the sides. Shit. That was their solution. One guy was like, just put your finger in the hole. That's the solution. <laughs> you stand there, you stand there, yeah. you stand there. Um, and then they did a modern day investigation in 2014, and they found that the steel was um, half as thick as it should have been for a tank that size. That guy was pocketing that fucking money. That's right. Um, uh, so 
let's see, the United States Industrial Alcohol Company ultimately paid out $600,000 in an out-of-court settlement, which is $6.5 million today. Um, she was. Relatives of those killed uh, reportedly received $7,000 each, which is the equivalent of over $100,000. Um, and some authors believe that the, that the main reason that that molasses tank was so full is because the 18th Amendment, which was going to enact prohibition, was um, being ratified the next day oh on God. January 20th, 1919. So they were just trying to make as much fucking alcohol as they could <laughs> before prohibition started. And then they could make that sweet black market money. It's prohibition again. Um, <laughs> so... I'm laughing, and now I have to say this part. <laughs> Over 150 people were injured. Um, and uh, people ha actually had coughing fits for like a month afterwards because of all the alcohol and stuff that was in the air, wow. um, the chemicals that were in the air. And 21 people died that wow. day. Most of them were from the nearby paving yard. Um, uh, so Patrick Breen, 44, John Callahan, 43, Peter Francis, 64, William Duffy, 58, James Keneally, um, no age, John Sieberlich, 69, there were some Teamsters, William Brogan, who was 61, Eric Laird, who was 17, James Lennon, 64, Peter Shaughnessy, he was 18, um, the fireman who died was named George Leahy, he was 38, so two drivers died, Flaminio Galleriani, 37, and Ralph Martin, who was 21, uh, a Bay State Express foreman, his name was James McMullen, he was 64, um, a guy named Cesar Nicolo, 37, um, was killed. A longshoreman named Thomas Noonan, who was 43, died. Michael Sinnott, who was a messenger, who was 76. Holy He crap. died. It's fine. <laughs> um, Bridget Clardy, who was the guy who made mm -hmm. the boat, that was um, his sister. She was 65. Um, and Stephen Clardy, 34, he died. And then um, the little boy who rode the wave of molasses, his older sister Maria died. She Aww. was 10. Aww. And then another 10-year-old, uh, Pasquale Ian Tosca, died. Aww. And that is the tragic story of the great molasses flood of 1919. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that nutso? That's fucking bananas. A couple... A couple jobs ago, I had a I had a job on a TV show, and it was um, one about time travel. And so we had to pitch stories of like, oh, what should they go back? What times um, in you know in history should they go back to? And this was my first pitch, <laughs> <laughs> and I was so excited. I'm like, this is the best fucking idea in the world. I was like, and then da da da, and I explained the whole thing. And then the guy I was pitching to goes, yeah, how are we supposed to do that? <laughs> Just like, awesome. <laughs> I'll save that for my animated show. <laughs> um, do we have time for a hometown? I think we do. Oh, we do. Yeah. We do. All right. Let's fix our undergarments. I We're will just briefly, very briefly right. tell you the rules. We I know, know you them. probably know them already. But we love it when it's local. That's the best because uh, we're here with you guys. Also, I, I'd love to hear a nice, strong accent if we could. Because mm -hmm. um, nobody ever does Boston accents right. So if you guys can, we'd like to hear it. Um, please don't be so drunk you can't follow your own train of thought. It's just boring. Um, <laughs> Know the details of your story, please. Have a beginning, middle, and an end. The end is really important, because if you just go, I don't know what happened to him, <laughs> it really bums people out. And just remember, if you get picked, everyone else hates you, so you have to go fast. Okay. Let me see. You want to go? You want me to go? Okay. I'm scared. Hi. I don't like doing this. You want to go? Okay. Am I? Yeah. Vince is right there, go over to him. I hate doing this. Yeah. Uh-oh, Karen's got a cough drop yeah. going. We're about to party. Do it, I can smell <laughs> it from here. Yeah. Oh. Which hi. way? Here she Her comes. Phone. Hi. Oh, hi. 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 What's your name? My name is Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Rachel? It's Rachel, everybody. Hi. Hi. Let's center up. You guys match. 
I yeah. almost, I almost wore those shoes. I have them. Aren't they comfortable? They're so comfortable. Oh, oh, sorry. That's okay. Okay. Where are you so from? I, I've lived here for five years, but I'm from Connecticut. Boo. I know. <laughs> but listen. I'm kidding. Don't boo her. <laughs> you can drive three hours here and end up in another country. It's not like California. I know. So my hometown is the story of Tracy Thurmond, and it was made into a Lifetime movie. Mm. So, my dad went to high school with a woman named Tracy Thurman, and she dropped out when she was 16 to take care of her ill mother, um, and her mother passed away, unfortunately. I'm, like, so nervous. I can't I believe know, I'm right? up here. I know. That's wait, wait. so crazy. Can we have the lights up so she can no, see what the whole... Shower. Ca- <laughs> no, don't shower. No, I'm So... Her mother passed away, and she was like, whatever, I'm going to travel up and down the East Coast. I'm going to do what I want. It's the 80s. And she went, I don't know, somewhere down south, and she met a guy named Buck, which is red flag number one. Sure. Because his name is Buck. Yeah. And they were waitressing, or well, I guess just she was. She was waitressing, and they moved all over the place, and things started getting icky. And she was like, I don't like this. I want to move back up to Connecticut. So she moves back up, he comes with her, and they get married. And she's like, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm going to marry him anyway. Things start I relate. To- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes mm-hmm. you have to. Yeah, sometimes you have to. So she, um, things start to escalate a little more. He's abusive, and because it's the 80s, everyone's like, it's not our business, even though it is their fucking business. Right, right. Mind um, your business, everyone says. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they eventually get, you know, they have a kid and stuff like that, but then they separate. She's living with her friend, and he's living, I don't know, in a fucking shithole, hopefully. Um, And and they're fighting, they're fighting, they're fighting, and then one day he serves her with paper, or she serves him with papers, and he's pissed. And at this point, this is the mid-'80s, and it was June of, I think, 1986, and between October of 85 and June of 86, she'd called the cops on him like 20 times because she he was stalking her, all this other stuff. So he's coming up there, and she's like, for fuck's sake. So she calls again, and my hometown is like the size of this auditorium. It's not big mm-hmm. at all. So the cops are like, all right, all right, we'll get there, we'll get there. And um, the cops don't get there, and... He stabs her, and she goes outside, and she's like, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. So she's yelling. She's running around the yard trying to get everyone's attention, and he's still coming after her. And then the cops show up and are like, well, 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 what is going on here? So they decide the best course of action is to take the knife and detain it. Not the man. They take the knife, and they detain it. The man walks, or the cop walks down this long, long, long driveway, with the knife, and is like, well, this is the problem. we got to get this out of here. And puts the knife in the trunk of the car. Meanwhile, poor Tracy is not doing well in the yard. The guy goes inside. He gets... The, the husband goes inside. He gets the kid. He's, like, torturing her with the kid, all of this stuff. The ambulance comes. He's still trying to get at her while she's in the ambulance because the fucking cops haven't detained him for some reason. She's in the hospital for months and months and months and months, and she survives. Oh, and she is the first woman to sue an entire city <laughs> and to sue... Fuck. Yeah. And to sue an entire police department. She wins $1.8 million. Holy and I don't have a shit. magazine, but in 80s money, like, I think that's a lot. That's, that's a lot, a lot yeah. of money. And she went on to help, like, go into domestic... You know, domestic violence work and all that stuff. Sometimes my dad sees her at the grocery store and gives her a hug. Fuck yeah. And her shithead husband only got seven years. (sighs) But, like... Shit. I mean, she made history, so I guess, I don't know. Fuck, yeah. Yeah, that's a good ending. All right. (laughs) Well done. Love a survival story. Hell yeah. Thank you. That was great. Good job. Good job. Um... I think we have a minute. We have. Oh, yes. Oh, we have. We got really. Uh, Stephen texts us facts about the town we're in, and one of them is that uh, one of our favorite Twitter accounts that started from my favorite murder uh, that are it's here. My, it's my favorite murder out of context. I don't know if you guys follow that. 
And the people that started are, will you guys come up here? You got, you're both here, right? Right here, yeah. Hi, come over here. Are you here? Here they are. We get to say hi to them. If you're... Um, go over to where Vince is. You have is, to go where Vince is. And he'll bring you up here. It's his job. Yay. Um, this is... This Twitter feed it is so exciting because I go on there. When I went on the first time I read it, I was reading it and laughing out loud. And I looked at George and I go, we're really funny. <laughs> this is good. It was the first time Karen was like, I thought like we say. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Here, this is, is it, Ange. Is it Ange? And that's Alex. Okay. Hi. Nice to meet you. <laughs> you guys, thank you so much. Thank you. You guys thank are consistently you. so funny. Yes. Um, yes. We need to do our best. We <laughs> try. <laughs> try. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, it's actually a really funny story. Tell you story. Yes, we please tell you do. How. Please. So, um, we dated in high school, mm -hmm. and then didn't talk for eight years, and then started dating again last November, Oh! and pretty much right away I was like, hey, I'm super obsessed with this podcast, <laughs> you should definitely check it out, and she did, and that she was like, yeah, this is great, and that's kind of, that was yeah. it. And then, okay, so the first episode ever, I'm listening, and it was you, Georgia, you were like, I'll have the collusion on the rocks, <laughs> and I was like, I'm about to write that down. <laughs> And she already listened to the whole thing, so then yeah. I'm like, start writing down quotes. I start the Twitter, you know, whatever. I'm, as I'm going through listening to it, I'm tweeting, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> whatever. I, and I have no idea that this is going on. Yeah. <laughs> but then one day I'm on Twitter and I see my favorite murder out of context, and I'm like, oh, this is funny. <laughs> and then I start scrolling through the feed, and then we were, you know, hanging at my house one night, and I was like, have you seen this Twitter, My Favorite Murder Out of Context? It's like pretty good, but I, I have some suggestions. I wonder if they... <laughs> I wonder if this person takes uh, recommendations, you know? And she's like, yeah, I do. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> Wait, so, so what I was doing was I was like hearing them and like just tweeting them. This... <laughs> um, I'm there's a Virgo, a, <laughs> so there's a Google Doc now. There's a Google spreadsheet. We have a spreadsheet, oh, so right away wow. I was like, we got to know what every going. single episode is from. <laughs> yep, I was like, we got to know what episode it's from. Tab. Yep, there's Mini a tab. Mini has its own tab. Yeah, there's a tab. Uh, uh, conditional formatting, so we you know guys do <laughs> more work than we do on the actual podcast. Well, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't want word. us to post repeats, so I was like, obviously, we need a spreadsheet like, so we can track this shit. If it repeats, it repeats. God, really respect um, that. So, yeah, so now every week we listen to the Minnesota the episode, yeah, and we crazy. both write tweets down and put yeah. them in the Google Sheet. Thank um, you so much. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. So cool. Thank you for being fucking hilarious because <laughs> obviously without both of you this wouldn't be happening. Yeah, so. yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I actually like I already have a, a tweet ready for tonight. <laughs> I got one ready. Yeah, this is the one. It was uh, it's out of context, but it was from you guys know right before Georgia was about to um, flash Karen when she was coming out the <laughs> out the elevator. She was yeah. like, "This is my fucking chance." Yeah. <laughs> this is my fucking chance. So this right. is my fucking chance. So um, I'm really broke, but um, <laughs> I really I really was hoping. <laughs> me to get a ring pop for her earlier and I was like <laughs> um Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> well, congratulations, yeah. you guys. I mean, I'm shaking. <laughs> <laughs> what a beautiful thing! <laughs> Amazing. Here, stay it, up with us. It feels us, like we should leave, but I know. <laughs> so, this is our show. So, uh, thank you, guys. Thank yeah. you all so much for being here. Yeah, stay here with us. Yeah. Um, this is just one example of the fucking incredible community that this podcast has somehow started. And we are honestly so honored to be a part of your guys' lives and, and all of what's happening here. It's an amazing experience. It couldn't be more fun. It's incredibly beautiful. Yep. And it just... It's it's thank you so We're fucking honored. much. Fucking thank you honored. all. Thank, thank you, you too guys. so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you guys, hey, stay sexy. And thanks you guys.